Now we have one of the veterans of Liverpool Beach, one of the first personalities on this scene, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, who started seven years ago. Next minute he's on top of the piano, and then he's on the balcony, climbs up the balcony, <laughs> and he's up with the mic, then he jumps off and he went right through the top of the grand piano. Well, I can tell by the way that you look at me I can tell, pretty baby, it's so plain to see They were a very good band. They could put on a show and they really did put on good shows. They don't get their story told in full. Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were one of the most popular bands on a Liverpool rock and roll circuit that boasted countless homegrown acts, like the Remo Four, the Big Three, King Size Taylor and the Dominoes, the Searchers, Derry and the Seniors, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and of course, the Beatles. At one time, they were the most popular band in Liverpool, which is quite an achievement considering that illustrious list I just gave you. But outside of the city, their story has become little more than a footnote in the history of rock and roll, because their drummer, Richie Starkey, later to be known as Ringo Starr as part of the Hurricanes, went on to worldwide fame with the Beatles. Well, it's a much bigger story than that. One that encompasses the birth of Liverpool's music scene, the notion of giving back to your community, and despite it also being a tragic story, it's an inspiring one. Rory Storm was born Alan Caldwell in Liverpool on January 7, 1938. At school, he was a star athlete, excelling in swimming, skating, and football. You could say he was a star before he ever got into music, and his biggest fans were his sister Iris and his mother Vi, later nicknamed Ma Storm. Dave Jameson, or Jamo, to his friends, remembers Rory's mom. If they were alive today and I took you and I said, come on, we'll go down and meet Ma Storm, We'd go in, and as you'd come in, I'd just introduce you, and she'd say, okay, and she'd just get all the arm and take you, and she would show you all Rory's trophies from his swimming really? and his running and everything, yeah. and then all Iris's trophies from the dancing and everything, you know. Right. And because she was as proud as punch of them, you know. Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lone Street, that heartbreak hotel. Like every teenage boy in Liverpool, and for that matter, around the world, young Alan's life was changed when he first heard American rock and roll. He wanted to be a rock and roller, like his heroes. He wanted to be on the stage. The only trouble was, he had a stutter. When you sing, you can't stutter unless you mean to stutter. Anthony Hogan is the author of a new book about Rory called From a Storm to a Hurricane, published by Amberley Publishing. Hogan has a stutter himself and explains how Rory was able to overcome that problem. You've got to force it out then. So he was doing that on stage. He can sing, right? So he sings, he's fine. Now, when he's talking on stage, if you listen to the last few days, he sounds like Elvis. Right, ladies and gentlemen, next song is this. And it's as if he's using an American accent to stop his stutter. Here we go now with No Cow Blues. That don't move me at all. Let's get real gone this time. Yeah. I woke up this morning. proud of him because he's had this terrible stammer and when he had a stammer back in the 50s everybody thought you were stupid now mm. he, he wasn't and like he had to get through all that 
and then he decides, I'll go stand on a stage in front of everybody and sing. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? It's Rory's Revenge is what it is. It, Rory's <laughs> Revenge, I like that, David. <laughs> That's I what it is. I might have to pinch that. <laughs> that sounds like a T-shirt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like it. I'm telling artists. <laughs> You'll love it. Dave Jameson remembers the first time he met Rory. Rory and I were avid Liverpool Football Club fans. In those days, you couldn't go on the cop until you were 16 years of age. We all went into the boys' pen. The 25th of February was my 16th birthday, so the week before, a couple of weeks before, I went to the match. And I was with my mates behind the goal. I had my birth certificate with me, and they, they let me in. And I'm standing there, and there's this guy standing next to me. If he was six foot, he was six foot one. Right. Never spoke, nothing. Couldn't make conversation with him at all. And then they kicked off, and Johnny Whelan scored. And by the time he shouted goal, because of this impediment in his speech, they kicked off, and Billy Little had scored another one. Right, I got you. So I says to him, I'll shout goal for you. And that was the start. That was the friendship. A long-lasting friendship. And after the game, we were chatting, and he says to me, um, where do you live? I said, I live in Walton. So he said, oh, he said, uh, I live in Broad Green, Old Swan, Broad Green Road. So I said, oh, I said, I go to the army cadets in Edge Lane. So he said, well, after the army cadets, call in. So I said, OK. I called in at Rory's, knocked on the door, and his mum come, Vi, March Storm, used to call it. Mm-hmm. I said, you must be Jamo. I said, yeah. She said, happy birthday. And as I walked in, there was a young guy sitting there playing the guitar in his school uniform. And he said, is it your birthday? And I says, yeah. He said, it's mine too. And it was a young 14-year-old George Harrison. Because <laughs> he went out with Iris. Here's Anthony Hogan. George was only 14 then. Right. She was 14. And she just hold hands and things like that. Yeah. Like a little thing. Him and then when she was 17, she dated Paul, yes, for a while. Um, but she dated Frank Highfield at the same time. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, and she didn't tell either of them, so fair play to her. <laughs> so so when, when he was singing I'll Remember You, maybe he had Iris in mind. Well, well, he might have done, might <laughs> he? I remember you. You're the one who made my dreams come true A few kisses ago And now back to J-Mo at Ma Storm's house. I didn't drink, but one of the, the guys at work, the garage where I work, so it's saving me time, he gave me a bottle of brown beer, and I knocked the top off. And Vi came in, Ma Storm, and took the bottle off me. Give me a little slap across the face. <laughs> Give George a slap. She got a glass, poured the beer in front of us, sat down, and she drank it well. in front of us. And she said, that'll teach you the <laughs> yeah, lesson. Yeah, it did. <laughs> and it, it just went on and on from there, you know. And um, in the middle of March, I met Rory in the uh, record shop. And I Now, said, were you, you were a big rock and roll fan, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So what year was this? As you said it was 1957. 1957. So you know. rock and roll had just... Broken. Oh, yeah, but but, but I, I had an uncle that went away to sea. Right. And he'd come into New York all the time. Now, I, I had uh, Gene Vincent's Be Bop Lula six weeks before it ever came out in England. Right. Like a lot of people in Liverpool, you know. So, a few weeks later, we were rehearsing to go to the Royal Tournament in the Edinburgh Tattoo with the band, because I was a sergeant drummer. And I'm walking down St. Oswald Street... Uh, on a Sunday with me drum, me sergeant stripes and all me boots all build up, and I heard, hey, J-Mo, and when I looked over, it was Alan, and a friend of his, and they came over, and they both had guitars, 
that I think they bought out of the Daily Mirror for about seven and six, <laughs> made out of matchbox wood, right, you know. Right, sure. And Johnny says to me, well, when he introduced me, it was Johnny, who was later to become Johnny Guitar. He said, um, I suppose you're a, uh, a drummer. So I said, I suppose you're a... Um, a guitarist <laughs> and Rory said no but we effing well soon will be you know <laughs> so he said we're going to start the skiffle group so he said can you come and get on your drums and I says well I- I'm heavily into the cadets I said I'm going to get promoted to sergeant major I said but what I'll do is I'll come up and go to yours after band practice on a Sunday and we go and I used to go I used to put the snare drum on bricks and it was in like a corrugated air right. raid shelter type um shed and Rory had me in there because it would echo right and it was rock on and line out of set sure. of brushes you know and I, I should I, let me just jump in for a second for the audience because uh, here in America we had the folk music boom with the Kingston trio and yeah. like that here and in in Britain it was Lonnie Donegan and Skiffle and I guess that show uh, six five special right was the yeah. big TV show that he was yeah. on there so everybody across the country even though I think Everybody secretly wanted to play rock and roll. Yeah. Skiffle was somehow that was, easier uh, to do. Yeah, I mean, it was all rock and roll. You right, know? right. I mean, a lot of the bands in Liverpool played Skiffle because of Lonnie Donegan and everything. Sure. The James Boys that Ted was with played Skiffle. But the Dominoes, the Bobby Bell Rockers, and uh, Bob Evans and the Five Shillings, they always played rock and roll from the very beginning. They right. never played Skiffle. And then, of course, what happened was... The Quarrymen, Al Storm and the Texans, which was Rory, Rory in the end, right. and Jerry with the, the, the Mars bars and everything, they all started to play rock and roll, and then that, that made the trend for the city. Just let me hear some of that rock and roll music, any old way you choose it, it's got a backbeat, you can't lose it, any old time you use it, it's got to be rock and roll music. If you want to dance with me, I have no kick against... Brian Kelly saw there's something going on here, he said so, and that's why he started the hold. He had an electrical business, and he made um, PA systems and amplifiers, and he used to hire them out to the <laughs> bands, you know. Right. And uh, He had a good little business for himself oh, with did, all those yeah, bands yeah, in he Liverpool. Was, he, had sure. a, he had a good insight, but then he just stuck to his... His own halls, which he had going great. He had one in Warrington and things like that, you know. And But Sam Leach, he, he put the big shows on on, on the tower, you know. Uh, and, of course, Sam, uh, Rory and myself were good friends because we had a catalyst because we were all Liverpool fans, you know. Right. And I still see Sam today, you know. So while everybody in Liverpool was, was playing American records, obviously you've got the Larry Parnes stable of stars yeah. starting. Marty Wilde and his Wildcats. Tommy yeah. Steele was the first, yeah. really. Yeah. Did anyone in Liverpool at the time think, hey, we need to go down to London to uh, start a career? It was just like, no, no, no. We've, they're it's, doing a different it's thing there. It's surprising that Rory and Johnny knew that something big was going to happen. Because from, from 1959, they started collecting the tickets and posters. Really? They had an idea wow. that something was going to happen. I mean, the first time they went to Butlins, Rory Blackwell was there. That's when they came home and Alan changed his name to Rory, Rory Storm. Uh, Lou, uh, Wally went to Lou Walters. Ty right. went to Ty Bryan. And they named Ringo because he used to wear all the rings. Right, you know? right, sure. And uh, that, was, that was the change, you know. But I, I have a saying where I say, I would not change my teenage days for a big clock. Right. <laughs> because if you loved skiffle and rock and roll, Liverpool was the place to be. It's gotta be rock and roll music if you wanna dance with me. If you wanna dance with me. So, with the classic lineup of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes in place, Rory, Johnny, Ty, Lou, and Ringo, the band set about conquering the city one gig at a time, despite some stiff competition. Here's Anthony Hogan. Quite a lot of bands here, quite a lot of talent here. They were the show band, and some people called them a show band, um, um, a show band who, who were really good at doing rock and roll numbers. Um, 
Rory was an absolute showman. Um, so they could put on a show, and they really did put on good shows. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now come on a big hand for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. <laughs> Jamo remembers his stint as a roadie for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and some of the band's wildest performances. You see, if you had wheels, you had an automatic roadie. Right. <laughs> you know, and we used to get Ringo's drums, put them under the stairs on the L3 bus to go to Crosby. Right. Get off the nearest station to the dance hall and take them back. And when we come back, they always had a couple of bob, you know. Right. And then Ringo would put his drums in the luggage compartment at Lime Street Station. Right. Until he required them next time, you know, <laughs> instead of dragging them all the way home, you know. He was lucky nobody stole them. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, things like that. And then I got Joe Flannery's van, because Joe's mum had a, a corner shop by where I lived. And when I moved out to Kirby with my parents, Joe had a mobile shop there. And I used to get the van, you know. Right. And um, over the road was the youth club, Westvale. And we couldn't always get a full football team, so I used to get John Kennedy, um, Rory, Ty, Lou, Freddie Marsden, Freddie Starr now and again. And we used to make a team up with the youth club. This was late 59, early 60. And when the youth club started to go down, the youth club leader was J Jerry Tansy, Tommy Tansy of Everton's brother. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rory said, do you think we could get the pitch? And I said, well, I'll ask. I said, can we get, can we use the school pitch? Anybody got permission? And that's when we started the Showbiz 11. And as it grew on, all the other bands started to come in, you know. Right, they all joined in. You know, the Joey Bauer and them out of the foremost and everything. Right. And it went very well. And we used to... Uh, do games and Rory had charged sixpence or a thripney bit to get in <laughs> and then the money he'd take to hold Ray Children's Hospital helped towards buying beds you know Wow. all that far back you know Right. Uh, but he was an athlete I mean if he got in trouble with lads in the local dance he'd just put his running gear off and pass them and he'd never catch him right. <laughs> you know he would never catch him wow. he was just tremendous they used to do um, New Brighton up near Bats and there was one special one where with the El Preston and the TTs mm -hmm. they'd be playing and Rory would be there now this this swimming pool had a diving board that was absolutely huge right. it was like one of them that you watch the fella dive in the circus you know sure yeah is? yeah yeah and Rory he had an extended lead doing roll over Beethoven right he'd be in his jeans and gold army top he'd go round to the diving board strip off his gold army trousers and he'd have a pair of gold army swimming trunks <laughs> and the band would be playing sure, all over the going. he'd climb right to the top of the top diving ball which no one else were allowed to go and he'd do a perfect pike into right. the pool <laughs> swim round get up gold army towel sure dry himself <laughs> right. put his jeans on his top and finish the song right. <laughs> He did, every, he did everything but comb his hair on the way down, yeah. And he, he went to various dances. At one time, he he climbed up on a, a box affair, you know, like these theatres have box affairs. Right. Got up there, jumped off, missed the stage, broke his leg. Another time at the plaza, he got up, stood on the fire extinguisher, and it went off all over wow. everybody, you know. And he, he, was, he was just, that was just his way. One of Rory and the Hurricanes' chief rivals were the Beatles, consisting at that time of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and drummer Pete Best. But they were also good friends. Here's Anthony Hogan. We were very, very good friends. 
very good friends. They were hanging around together. They played together in Hamburg, um, and they played over here as well, um, together all the time. They were always getting along. Um, there's quite a few occasions where one member was sick and someone else had changed places out of each band. Here's Jamo on the Beatles. The one thing about the Beatles is they were very musically minded and they wrote their own stuff. That was the catalyst they had above everybody else. When they went to Hamburg and then they ended up in the Kaiserkiller and the constant playing was Krimmer. But the big thing was, and this is the big thing between Liverpool bands and the London bands, because even Cliff Richards wasn't doing it, was the double pedal on the bass. Pete Best and Ringo started doing that. And the reason for it was the club used to hold that many people. They had to do it to be heard. In August of 1962, just on the verge of recording their first single for EMI, Love Me Do, the Beatles fired their drummer Pete Best and replaced him with Rory's drummer, Ringo Starr. Contrary to popular belief, Rory's band didn't split up right after Ringo left. Here's author of From a Storm to a Hurricane, Anthony Hogan. They kept going. Um, you read in a few books that they fell apart after Ringo, but that isn't true. They kept going um, um, until Ty died. They carried on for five years, and they were still working, getting all the jobs everywhere. In fact, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes would record several singles for the Oriole label, including a rocked-up version of Beautiful Dreamer. But the records never clicked with the public like their live performances did. I know that version of um, that the Hurricanes do, they were the first band who grabbed that and thought, they said, we'll play this song, because obviously it's a very slow song, and a beautiful sure. dreamer. All the bands here were, were doing that, they were going out, trying to find a record, can we speed it up, is it going to sound any good? Once again, Rory's friend and associate, Jamo. I think one of Rory's problems was, and Johnny, was they always managed themselves, but they did... Um, What's his name? Jenkins, the funeral fella, did manage them for a bit. He took them all over to Spain and France right. and that, you know. Ringo left, and he had Keith Hart... Was it Keith Hartley? Drumming. Then they had Brian Johnson. They had quite a few drummers. Then Jimmy Chushingham. And he was with them for about four years, Jimmy. In 1967, guitarist Ty O'Brien collapsed on stage and later passed away after complications from surgery. Rory Storm and the Hurricanes quietly disbanded. On September 28, 1972, Rory Storm, who had been suffering from a prolonged illness, passed away in his sleep. The post-mortem revealed that he had alcohol and sleeping pills in his blood, but not enough to cause his death. It's believed that his mother, Vi, went to wake her son up in the morning, found him dead, and overcome with shock and grief, took an overdose of sleeping pills, and committed suicide. What I've heard is that he had a terrible chest infection for, well, a, a good six weeks or two months. Right. And he, he just took the tablets and, because he didn't drink, Rory. And then the mother came in and found him, and so she committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, well, it's... Uh, which is just typical Vi, you know, because he was her idol. Find me way, sing the 
buttons. <laughs> Bye, cats. But the legend of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes would never die, and his legacy continues. I was with Rod Stewart, 12 months Christmas gone, at New Jersey. We had VIP tickets because my me, me son's mate, Dave, has played drums for 18 years for Rod. And Rod Stewart's a cracking fella. He's approachable, you can talk to him, you know, he's, there's nothing about him whatsoever. And um, he came backstage, we were walking down, and I walked up and we were there and he said hello. And, and I said, you won't remember, but the last time I was with you was in the cavern in 1963. <laughs> I said, I was sitting by us and you were with Long John Baldry, Beryl Marsden. I said, and you were watching Rory Storm on stage in leopard skin trousers. Ah. Uh, <laughs> with course, the hair, too. Right, he had his mic up in the air. Right. He was going along with the mic. He was having sex with the mic and right. everything. <laughs> you look at Rod Stewart and his antics of one of the same. And he just said, say no more. Before we go, we'll ask our guests to tell us what they're working on now, beginning with JMO. Well, the Mersey Rats, it, it, start, it started off as the Mersey Cats. Right. And it was all the original bands of the 60s come down and they, they play and raise money for kids. But like everything else, politics goes in and everything. Yeah, yeah, of course. Anyway, I broke away and I started the uh, Mersey Rats in Lay Them All. It was a community centre for the locals. Brian Kelly took it over. There used to be small dancers there. Brian Kelly took it over. Of course, the Beatles played there 10 or 12 times before the Cavern. But sure. the Cavern is the one with the big name. But I always believe in foundations. Right. If the lay them hadn't happened and the little hadn't happened, right. it might not have happened at the Cavern. Sure. And this is what it's all about. But the memorabilia is fantastic because one half is cinema. Right. And the other half is all memorabilia of music and everything. It's brilliant. And he's got full size statues of Buddy Holly, Elvis. Yeah. All over the place. Motorbikes hanging from the ceiling. Right. You know? <laughs> and it's just a tremendous place. And the atmosphere is great. And I've got one of the best crowds and the most generous gang of people that come in and I owe them a lot. On Facebook, Maisie Rats. And by the way, the Latham Club can be found on Facebook too. Just look for the Latham, L-A-T-H-O-M. You know, the inspiration for this radio special was Anthony Hogan's book on Rory Storm called From a Storm to a Hurricane. Here's Anthony to tell us where we can find the book. Yeah, it's on Amazon. If you're over in the States, it must think Amazon there. Uh, Shipping them out on the 10th of August, I think, to start. To send yeah. them out over there. Well, you can get it off the publishers. They were called Amberley. Um, they're in England. They'll send it out to you. Um, or, or try the bookstores. Um, if you've got a good bookstore, they'll probably order it for you. Once again, From a Storm to a Hurricane by Anthony Hogan. You can find it on Amazon or at a fine bookstore near you. And the publisher is Amberley Publishing. And we'll wrap up our look at Rory Storm and the Hurricanes with a song by a former member. <laughs> 